What's going on, everybody? It is that time again. The Sooners Illustrated Podcast, episode 84 on this Thursday, May 16th, 2024. I just moved, so I'm in an empty room. Colin's in Houston, so he's in a hotel kitchen. So mm. we're uh, but we're figuring it out. Josh Calloway, Colin Kennedy with you on a Thursday. We've got some portal defensive tackle movement, if you want to call it like that, that we're going to get into. Um, Colin, like I said, is on the road down in Houston, so we'll kind of catch up with him, what he's doing down there on the recruiting side. And then it looks like basketball, again, contrary to reports, is going to fill the team. They filled out their roster this week with a couple more transfers. We'll talk about that a little bit on the back end. But CK, first of all, just how are you doing? The travel to Houston, you said there's a tornado coming through there later. Are you good? Are you utter safe? chaos. Utter chaos. I didn't, I didn't think we'd have as hectic of a podcast setup than the one we had a couple weeks ago that True. we aired. And now here we are. I just hauled from this very hotel kitchen to a -Leaf Hastings, and I had roughly 15 minutes to get there and talk to a high four-star recruit, haul back here, launch the show. You're moving into a place. Yeah, we're, we're this is utter chaos, but we're, we're sticking through it, right? We're battling through. We're battling through busy times, but uh, we're battling through. And we appreciate everybody being with us on a Thursday. Like I said, a few things we want to get through. Let's go ahead and dive into the football portal stuff. So, again, if you're with us on Monday, it felt like the dust had settled in the portal for the most part. Oklahoma was probably pretty much set with where they were. Um, but then Jermaine Lole flipped to Texas. We talked about that on Monday. We then got into Brandon Lane a little bit as a potential option to Stephen F. Austin um, transfer. He's in the portal right now. Give an update, Colin, on where things stand with Lane. And then a new name has kind of emerged as a very real possibility in Aiden Huntington from UL Monroe. A guy who was pretty productive last year. I was kind of looking into him a little bit. Eight and a half sacks last season. Now his name seems to be one that is gaining some traction. You reported to our VIP members trying to get him in town for a visit this week. Just kind of where did everything stand with these portal defensive tackles Oklahoma looks to, you know, kind of replace the, the spot that was opened up by low life flipping. Yeah, so obviously I didn't talk a ton about the whole Jermaine Lole situation because you guys touched on that on the Monday podcast. Yeah. So bringing that into this equation as far as how it relates to these two, look, the bottom line here is if Oklahoma was going to be able to replace Jermaine Lole with a very capable body who made sense for the future of that room, they were going to explore options. and. I know you mentioned it during the Monday show. You know, I reported that Oklahoma was in contact with Brandon Lane right. before not only Dominic Williams had committed, they were in contact with him before he even decommitted from Michigan State in the portal. So this is a guy who's been on Oklahoma's radar for a little while. Once things reopened, definitely made plenty of sense to go ahead and pursue him. Oklahoma got involved, a little bit of a meeting there between Lane and Oklahoma. But right now, I think, and I noted it for our subscribers, kind of a little bit of a pause button hit on this mm. portal recruitment. So Brandon Lane checked out LSU, to my knowledge. It sounds like that went well. But I also think that LSU is kind of approaching this similar to Oklahoma and that still a little bit of a feeling out process maybe. Now, I know Brandon Lane wants to wrap his – process up relatively soon, but how that's going to look, I don't know. So to me, the way I'm kind of looking at this, if I'm being honest, Josh, kind of like a, a pivot point at this, this juncture for Oklahoma and Brandon sure. Lane, they get to sort of continue to test the waters, look at other options with Brandon Lane still being there. And the way that it sounds, it does sound like Brandon Lane will at the very least be available in the portal as the next few days sort of play out. And so as it relates to those next few days and those other portal names, here comes Aiden Huntington. So former ULM interior defensive lineman, incredibly productive, eight and a half sacks last yeah. year, Josh, as an interior guy, I believe 16 total tackles for loss. So you have a individual who not only has produced – at a high level, specifically as an interior pass rusher, which is highly coveted, right? But then you have someone who can fit right into your defense in sort of a complementary role, 
probably would slot right into Oklahoma as a highly productive situational pass rusher, third down inside pass rush specialist off the bench. But Huntington is a little bit undersized. Mm. I believe he's about 6'1", 280. And that's going off of school measurements, right? So you never really know. Sure. But look, there, there's clearly a reason that Oklahoma is going to look into this guy. And you mentioned the visit. We'll see how things go here. Don't want to pull the curtain back too much, but long and short of it is like, I think that Oklahoma right now is maybe a little bit more interested in pursuing Huntington over Lane. I think that Huntington, I believe he has a few years of eligibility remaining, more than one. So that that would also be something to consider in this pursuit. And if you can add someone potentially who would replace a, a very meaningful get at the time in Jermaine Lolay and could come in and give you something like statistically proven pass rush ability inside, man, why not explore this? So we'll see. Long long story here, cut down, is that I think Oklahoma is just mm. sort of feeling things out with these two. We'll see how things go over the next few days. And I think with the options presented to Oklahoma on the table right now, couple different ways you could go, and I don't think that there's a wrong decision here. And last point I want to make, even if they don't end up taking either one of these guys, Josh, I think the beauty of it and a big reason why they're navigating the process this way, not the end of the world if you don't get either one, right? You're pretty comfortable with where this yeah. defensive tackle room is. you got some good young bodies. You want to get guys like Grayson Holton more playing time. Devon Sears flashed in the spring game, so – Oklahoma is in a pretty good spot, especially with a couple of portal names at defensive tackle. For sure. Yeah, I think it's two years uh, for Hunting, I, I think, because he, he's a I freshman so. in 2020, so that year doesn't count. And then in 2022, he, he was short in that year. I don't know for a fact it was injury, but I'm assuming it was injury. Um, so that'd be a medical, you know, medical redshirt that year. So he's played – because in 2021, he played 13 games. Last year, he played 12. And last year was far more – it was his most productive year by far. Like you said, he had a good season. I mean, 16 total tackles, eight and a half sacks there at ULM. So, yeah, I mean, I, I talked about it on Monday with, with Tom and James that it felt like all things considered with when it happened, when you lost the lay in May to pivot to Brandon Lane would have been a pretty good recovery. I feel the same way, maybe even more so with Huntington, with his background. I mean, this is a guy that, you know, was very productive at the FBS level. Granted, group of five, but FBS level, whereas obviously Lane becoming from a little bit lower than that. Um, but, you know, so, yeah, I think this is a pretty good pivot if you can find a way to to bring him in. Like you said, the luxury Oklahoma has, it's not do or die. They're going to be fine either way. This is a rotational depth add is what you're looking at. You got your big fish in Dominic Williams. That bought you the cushion uh, with this with this cycle. So, I'm with you. Um, it'd be a good ad if they can do it. We'll be sure to keep our VIP subscribers posted. Colin's been all over it. And, uh, yeah, we'll see how this progresses from here. But sounds like Oklahoma's has at least got a, a pretty decent chance with, with between one of these guys to uh, to add another body to that room after losing Lole somewhat suddenly and losing him to Texas, which we talked about on uh, the Monday show. If they want to is the obvious clear. Right, and they don't have – yeah, right. And that's the other thing. They don't – yeah, they have the, the – flexibility where they, you know, if they feel like, eh, we like what we have better, you can just do that. So yeah. you're, you're in good shape all around. The guy you had to have was Dominic Williams, and you got it. That provided the flexibility. As far as other stuff on the recruiting side of things, like we said, you're down in Houston. You're bouncing around to different schools. Spring ball is underway for high school football, same way in Oklahoma. Um, so just, you know, kind of catch us up, I guess, on what you're up to. You've been bouncing around a little bit, and a little, some news and notes from the, from the trail, from the road for you down there in a deep, deep South Texas. Yeah, man. Look, this is, this is my favorite aspect of this job. Now it's not easy. It's a little bit hectic as <laughs> we talked about a little bit earlier, a lot of not only collaborating a bunch of schedules, really hoping that players are there at the time you need them to be there. Mm -hmm flooring it in metropolitan traffic from one end of the city to another. And then, oh, by the way, I've got a nasty sunburn going on in the back of my neck. Oh, and, yeah, that time of year. Yeah. And now a storm is coming through. So <laughs> we'll see how this goes. But it's fun because a couple of layers to this. 
why I do these school trips, the in-person evaluation process, I don't always love, as I call it, the reality TV side of this, this world, but unfortunately that pays the bills. So you can interview these guys, check up on their recruitments, see what the latest is in their process. But the more fun aspects of getting to do these school trips and check in with recruits, building those relationships, getting to know these guys on a personal level, continuing to network and connect with Texas high school head coaches or high school football coaches in general who, I mean, salt to the earth, a lot of these, these guys and lots yeah. of stories to tell. Great meeting a bunch of these dudes and just getting to know a lot more people. And then you run into a lot of college coaches as well on these trips. I mean, get to talk to them and see how they're faring in their travels and talk to them about the current state of college football. Even a little fun fact, I, I ran into a former Oklahoma player who's now in the coaching realm while I was out here in Houston. So mm. th this is one of my favorite parts of the gig and it doesn't always draw a ton of clicks, but it does provide a ton of value. And that's where I'll start. First trip I made, got to see big Ryan Foje. Moved up one oh, spot yeah. recently to number 79 in the country. Fun fact. I mean, I, I'm blown away by him, Josh. Like, he, he had a frame that when I saw him last fall, you could just tell that if all came together, this guy was going to be a little bit different. And I pulled up to Bridgeland High, and you see him come onto the field. Looked like a completely different person. I mean, grown man, someone re responded to the video that I put out that he looked like Anton Harrison. And the crazy part is I may not necessarily disagree all that much. Right. I mean, he's still well-shaped from a frame perspective, not a ton of bad weight on him. The lower base is strong, but he's adding upper body strength. You can see it in his biceps and triceps and some of the shoulder width, like – Ryan Foje is becoming a complete offensive tackle. Where at maybe a, a few months ago, kind of checkpoint, he was developing as a promising perimeter protector. So just talking to him, he's he's obviously locked in with Oklahoma, but mm -hmm. his development as a recruit, you can see why we have him inside the top eighty in the country. So really cool to check in with him and Jonte Newman, who was once recruited by Oklahoma, headed to Texas A and M. Those two are. They're awesome guys. Really enjoy seeing them and talking to them. So that was one of the first stops that I made. The next day, got to go out to DeCaney. And interestingly enough, a little bit of recent action here at DeCaney High School. And, and that coaching staff was awesome. I, I really had a fun time connecting with those coaches there at, at DeCaney High. But they kind of let me know, hey, Oklahoma stopped by here not – a week ago and checked in with our dudes. And so I went out there to, to see him. Tanu Kynes, the four-star wide receiver, even plays a little bit of safety, which mm. I'm very interested in. <laughs> but neither here nor there. So Oklahoma has offered Tanuk for a while. They've been on the offer sheet. But what I had been hearing about Tanuk for months was basically it was kind of you know, up and down as far as the level of communication. But then OU sent a decent amount of the offensive coaching staff to check in with him, and they sat down and met for a long time, did Tanuk and OU's coaches. And so yeah. I just wanted to check in with Tanuk and see what that conversation was like, what the latest was there. And so I'll have that for subscribers, going to work on a story there. But then the other thing that I want to talk about as far as DeCaney OU offered a guy by the name of Nick Townsend, who I would encourage you at home if you're listening or watching after this podcast, because we would like for you to listen to the rest of the show, go turn on Nick Townsend's film and just enjoy because I had never seen this dude in person. OU offered him just last week. He's the number 103 overall recruit in the country, top three, top three athlete in the rankings across the country. And I mean, like from the moment you see him, you're like, yeah, that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. I, I tell this 
to people all the time. One of my favorite things in the world is when you can tell a guy is like an athletic freak when he's just doing stuff on air. Like Nick Townsend was blocking on air and just the way he was running. I was like, this, this dude's a freak. And then you, you watch him go through practice and without revealing too much, like what he did in some of the offensive and defensive portions of this spring camp, I was like, he could be an elite tight end or defensive end linebacker at the next level. There's no question in my mind. I think he's got a Sunday's future. Oh, you just entered the mix. And I've got some fun quotes coming to Sooners Illustrated about Nick Townsend. One of my favorites, he literally was like, man, I wish they offered me earlier. So he he's going to yeah. have a fun little commentary. And last thing on DeCaney, the first ever offer for Samaritan Cunningham, who was one of DeCaney's running backs, DeMarco Murray made OU the first ever school to extend a scholarship to Samaritan Cunningham. 5'8", 185 pounds, runs a 10'8 right now. So that will obviously increase in terms of 100 track time speed. Can split the safeties on tape. Really strong, compact build. A little rocked up he is. And I know DeMarco Murray really likes this guy. And I got a chance to see him and he looks really darn good. He's not the only one in that running back room, though, for DeCaney. I think they have a 2027 who's going to be a power four caliber player. And then his direct backup is going to be a guy that I think might be worthy of a few power four offers as well. Just missed, I believe, due to some injury time. So it was awesome to get out there to DeCaney. And then right. I capped it off checking in with Kobe Sellers, who just committed to Texas A&M. Oklahoma was basically in the final two. Just got to catch up with him. You know, Kobe's awesome guy. But then another dude at Shadow Creek who's a personal favorite of mine, Chris Stewart, is the wide receiver who visited for future freaks. I know Emmett Jones is very high on this guy. I am too. I think the world of Chris Stewart on and off the field, he had like two or three touchdowns in Shadow Creek spring game. Balling out, Moss two guys in double coverage down in the end zone. And, like, I think Oklahoma has a real chance to become a front runner for him Mm -hmm. if OU recruits him the way that he would like to be recruited by Oklahoma. Because I think I've mentioned this on the show before, but not only has Emma Jones really connected well with with Chris – He's also a huge CD Lamb fan and basically tries to model his game after CD. So a lot of OU ties for Chris Stewart there. And then today I became an incredible inconvenience because we got about 15 minutes heads <laughs> up. And Josh was gracious enough to be flexible with me. But Smith Arogbo, man, we talk about a lot of edge rushers on this show, Josh. CJ Nixon, Max Granville, Shield Knight. The list goes on and on. Smith Orogbo, does he get forgotten at times maybe in the world of OU recruiting? I don't know. Does OU really want him? They sent five defensive coaches out here to Elif Hastings to check in with him. And he told me in the coach's office out there, like, that just goes to show you how much that they want me. Right. So, man – I don't want to talk too much about Smith's recruitment because I will have that for our subscribers. So go ahead and sign up for Sooners Illustrated because we had an awesome interview with him. But I can see why OU really likes this guy. So he's about 6'4", 220, long arm, quick twitched, just an incredibly high ceiling. But Josh, quick story on him. So his dad did not want Smith playing football when he was younger. Smith Arogbo then promptly lied to his dad about going to tutoring. All right. And while he was at tutoring, he was at football practice. And now he went from lying about going to tutoring to 38 offers as an edge rusher. I just, that's the type of stuff that makes me love recruiting. Right. And he, he's a great kid, like high character, dude, high GPA, you can tell he's very gracious about everything, but he was leaving for SMU official visit tomorrow. And so Alif Hastings coaching staff was kind enough to say, hey, we're canceling our spring game tonight. If you can get over here, you can come talk to him yeah, and whoever yeah, else you want yeah. to. So Oklahoma's kind of, I think, in the top two or three with him, Josh. And he will be officially visiting OU in June. 
So I just want to bring him up real quick. I think Oklahoma is in a subtly good spot along with Texas, who I think is a, a very serious contender for him, and then Texas Tech. And so interesting one to monitor, and definitely we'll have more on him coming up. But a few other stops I've got coming up. Won't dive into the rest of all that, but basically that's that's the gist of what's going on here in Houston. We'll see if I survive the storm and then – a few more high school stops and camps coming up this weekend and all that's coming to the website. Battle through the storm and then get to the back end of it. That's an awesome story. The the line to you that it, it works out. If you then go and you stink, that story is not nearly <laughs> as good. But the fact that he has near 40 offers uh, makes it really cool. So look forward to reading more about him. Again, going VIP subscriber. Um, Collins went all over. He's out there on the trail right now in these different schools and all that good stuff. Also, credit to you. Uh, very good job. You seem to have very seamlessly pivoted to power four. I, I appreciate that. You didn't stumble at all when you're saying that. Because it still sounds actually weird. I practice in the car, believe it or not. <laughs> I just power four, power four, get the reps in. Not power five. There's always that one token comment. Well, it's power four now. Don't you guys cover the sport? Ah. Right, right, right. You've done a great job. And I'm now fine. basketball, which was really like a power six, is now power five. I don't know. It's too confusing, but we we take it one day at a time out there. I can't make any sense of anything in basketball. So very true. With, with that, good. let's talk On about that note, it. Um, <laughs> so OU basketball filled in the rest of the roster, and that's how we'll finish off the show here. They had two spots left, and they filled them. Now, okay, again, the caveat, the asterisk that I have to throw out there every time talking about this team in the roster, we still don't technically know officially what Jalen Moore is doing. Yeah. Um, so if Jalen Moore goes to the NBA, then they have a still have, they still have one more spot. But obviously, for the time being, the roster is full. You're not gonna you're not gonna take somebody and squeeze out Jalen Moore. He's would be your best player. So obviously, that spot as of now, the assumption is he's still on the team, right? So they fit it. They filled in the last two spots. We talked about it a bunch of times, Colin. They needed a big. They had no bigs. They went and got a big finally from Alabama. So it's also a power five transfer, which they also hadn't done. They've been all guys from the lower level. They went got a power five big. We're going to give the name a shot. Mohammed Wagi, I think is how we heard it was being said. If that's wrong, I apologize in advance. This is almost certainly your backup five. Uh, Sam Godwin's going to start, you would assume. Um, but Wagi should be that big physical presence off the bench, backup guy. And hey, if he earns more playing time, he earns it, you know. And uh, so he's kind of he filled a need that you desperately had. And then they went and capped it off yesterday with the final roster spot with one of our top Juco guys in the portal, number two Juco guy for 24 seven sports in Jeff Nwankwo, who is a local guy he's from PC North originally, Putnam city North. Um, so just, you know, if you're not up with Oklahoma geography, just down the road, not far at all from Norman over there, kind of in the Oklahoma city Metro, they bring him in. He's kind of like a wing guard forward type of player. So they bring him in to round out the roster. The, it seems like the team is, again, assuming you bring Jalen Moore back, is in place now. Thoughts on these two guys, just kind of everything um, with what Oklahoma's done. Like we said, they needed a bit really bad. It seems like what well, he seemed like, you know, obviously we'll see what he ends up being, but it seems like a pretty good, for your backup five, I mean, that's a pretty good add it would seem on paper. And then Wonkwo, you know, you're kind of hoping for a little bit of a diamond in the rough here. I mean, he's one of the top Juco guys. He's a local guy. I kind of like both these ads, especially at this point in the cycle. What about you? I, I think this is a pretty quality way to round out the roster, specifically yeah. relative to the needs that you had, right? So you mentioned Waggy, and man, I really hope that's how the name is. You we did a great the job. broadcast before we start recording, and that's how multiple broadcasts were saying it. So if it's wrong... That's on the Alabama pronunciation guy, because I'm assuming that's what they were going off of. So you're doing a great job with these names, by the way. And Waggy and, and Wonkwo, was that that's what it's what it was? So well, I didn't look that one up. I just went for it. So I think that's right. So on Waggy, six foot ten, uh, Tom put together an analysis piece. So I don't want to share too much of what Tom dug into as far as the overall fit, but I do think that you look at him. He was a pretty, I believe, quality offensive option as a big man. I believe I read, though, that he came off the bench, so he'll be familiar with the potential role uh, at Oklahoma. May not necessarily, though, 
be like the big who's going to give you like a ton of strong defensive minutes. But I think overall, man, this is a pretty pretty solid find for Porter Moser and crew. Like you want you want to find size, you want to find proven talent at this level of ball, and they get that in him. And then in Wonko, you mentioned you get a guy familiar with the area. I was talking about this with someone the other day. Man, sometimes one of the best things you can do, regardless of who you are, is recruit someone from the JUCO ranks because the toughness and resiliency that's often presented by those guys, man, yeah. like they they know how to go and get it. And it seems like in Wonkwo, not only a pretty quality player, but he might actually be a relatively complimentary fit here with some of the other guys on OU's roster. And so I, I think, look, kind of my primary takeaway here, right? You had pretty dire needs relative to these guys. And you went out and got two players who fit exactly what you're hoping for in terms of big, who can come off the bench, provide some size, provide some offensive minutes. You got a wing player who might be able to help you out if you need him to be not necessarily the guy because of Jalen Moore, for example, returns. That's going to be who you lean on out there. But, hey, man, like this guy could easily take some pressure off of others. And so... I think it's a pretty quality way to sort of round things out. We'll see what comes next because, like you mentioned, that you just never know in terms of some of the shifting here. But curious to hear your thoughts on these two guys because I, I, I really think yeah. kind of given the nature of where this program was, pretty pretty positive note to close things out. So Yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah, wa- wa- Wagi. Um there you go. Yeah, like you said, I mean, the last couple of years, he's played a lot of games for Alabama last couple of years off the bench. You know, plays about, you know, the last couple of years, eight, nine, ten minutes a game, roughly. You know, gets a few rebounds. You know, he's never been a starter for Bama. Um, but you're not looking for that here, right? I mean, you have Sam Godwin to do that. So, again, you know, he's 6'10". You just – this is going to sound maybe bad, but it's kind of a beggars can't be choosers situation for Oklahoma. They needed to be really bad. And you got one yeah. from Alabama – a good basketball program, a program that's been living in the tournament as of late. I don't think that's anything but a good add. And then, yeah, you're right with the Juco thing. You know, it's hard to know what you're going to get from Jeff Nwanko, but I love that he's a local guy and he is a nice wing for you, which they didn't really have that much. We talked about a bunch. They've just been piling up the guards. It's a lot of guards. And so we talked about how they need a big. They also kind of need more of these wing type players too. And so he scratches that itch. Kind of cool also, not that this means anything or matters, but for any OU baseball fans, he played at Cowley College, which is the same place that Bryce Madrin came from uh, for the baseball team. Kind of cool. But, yeah, so I think this is a pretty good way to finish the portal, uh, this this cycle. You know, I mean, you look at the roster where it is right now. So kind of get it pulled up here. Um, you know, I, I think it's kind of, you know, there are certainly a lot of question marks. You know, you didn't go get any big splash guys like you wanted. You know, those, mm-hmm. those guys we talked about a ton. You know, Garrison, Padula, those guys. But you did okay here. There's a couple of nice ads. You know, I don't know. It's hard to know what to make of the team because there's so many new faces, and I need to see some of them. And obviously, we won't make any final proclamations in May. But my, my feel right now is it's probably like a middle of the SEC team. You know, and it could be better. It could be worse. You know, I, I we'll find out soon enough, I guess. But – they did okay kind of wrangling it in the portal after it looked just disastrous there for a while. So maybe this might be the the way to sort of phrase it. On a scale of, let's say, 1 to 10, and I know I'm putting you on a, on a spot here, but like now that we kind of have a sense of where things are headed with this team, yeah. what's the optimism level for you? Like it's clear that you think this might be a team that could middle in the pack. But is that like best case scenario uh, somewhere on the scale here? Wh- what do you think is kind of the overview of how this team should be perceived? Yeah, I mean, they're not going to, you know, I'm very curious for like preseason rank poll. I think they're going to yeah. be pretty low in the preseason poll. That's my guess. Um, you know, without knowing like dead on, I, I still think like they're better than the Like Missouri didn't win a conference game last year, right? Like the SEC is not as deep as the Big 12. Um, there's some teams at the bottom that aren't very good. And we got their schedule earlier this week, too. We found out who they're going to play next year. They have a home-and-home home with Missouri. Vanderbilt comes to normal. Like, there's some winnable games on there. So, 
yeah, I would say optimism. I don't know, six. Like, I think they'll be around the middle. Of, like, I'm, that's kind of where I'm just at. Like, middle of everything. Like, they'll probably be an okay team. I don't think they're probably a tournament team right now. But maybe if they, you know, maybe some of these guys are better than I, you know, who knows, right? But, you know, I, I'm very curious. And an exercise I might get into with maybe Tom on, on next week's show, just what the heck is the starting lineup? Because you have Jalen Moore, who will obviously start. He's going to be your best player. They Sam Godwin is going to start. After yeah. that, you could talk me into like eight other guys who could start. So, yeah, there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of unknowns, to say the least. It's a kind of a hodgepodge group, but maybe that's better for Porter Moser. And, it, you know, what I mean, True. Who knows? So, I wow. would put mine, I would put me at a five. Like, I, to me, I see this as a toss up team. I, yeah. This is a this is a okay team, or it's a group that slides and finishes probably where some preseason projections will go. But like the way I'm kind of viewing this team right now is like this is very much a prove it team to me. Sure, because sure. You, you have some quality additions, so you can kind of like see the blueprint, right? Like there's a, there's at least a relative vision in terms of competitiveness with this squad. But I need to see it play out on the court. And uh -huh. so I think if you take it within the context of what we're talking about, if this is the roster, I think this is a proven squad. This is genuinely a team to me, the way it's currently put together, that will either help Porter Moser stay afloat or – the, this is going to be the squad that ultimately turns things around because they're there to me is either a pretty cap ceiling or a high level of yeah low variance. Sure. So I'm with you. So we'll see. And obviously we'll have a lot more time to talk about over the year, uh, over the yeah. summer and everything. And we'll figure out with Jalen Moore. He has another, what, a couple of weeks ish, less than that to yeah. decide um, officially. I think it was like May 28, 29, something like that was that deadline. So, We'll know for sure. Again, the expectation is Jalen Moore will be back. I will say my uh, perception of this team at Jalen Moore is not back. We'll take quite the hit because uh, that's your best player right now. So yeah. we shall see. We shall see. Uh, also, with that SEC schedule coming out, um, Kentucky gets to come to the LNC next year, which is going to be pretty wild. You lose Kansas, but you're gaining Kentucky. So that's pretty cool. Also, Otega Owa just transferred there. So Brandon he'll Garrison. Making, he'll be making his return in Brandon Garrison. So – Mark Polk, you know, who's the new coach there, he coached one game to LNC last year with BYU, and OU housed BYU. Uh, it was like their best win of the season. So uh, maybe a little house of horrors for him. I don't know. I, I expect it to be packed out. Whenever that game is, that almost doesn't matter. OU could be 0-20 when they're playing. It'll be packed for Kentucky to be in there. So that'll be cool. I don't know, man. Pope might have a little bit more talent now. So you may be looking at shops. Like 25-year-old guys who have like a full family at, at BYU. Uh, probably. That he rolled into the Lloyd Noble Center with a bunch of dudes who just like left the mortgage office. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like the, the, the guys he's got now are worried about different things. Guys are older than me playing out there. Uh, all right, I think that's it for now. Uh, we'll let Colin get back to it. He's a busy guy down there in Houston. Um, put in the work for our VIP subscribers. We'll be back, I think, uh, Monday. Yeah, Monday with, with Tom and James. And we'll recap whatever else is going on in the portal and – Anything else? Diamond Sports, of course, as well, are, are off and running in full swing. Final weekend for baseball and the uh, softball tournament starts this week, NCAA tournament. So we'll be sure to get into that on the Monday show. Colin, I'll be back with you later next week to hit some other recruiting stuff and portal news, all that good stuff that you've come to know and expect. We'll see you then for Colin Kennedy. I'm Josh Calloway. Be sure to subscribe. We'll see you back here next time on the Sooners Illustrated podcast.